Our scripture reading, our second scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew 16, verses 13 to 19. I'm going to take one more drink of water before I read that. I was singing too loudly. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> when I was 10 years old, I went to summer camp at a local church in our neighborhood. And while I was there as a 10-year-old kid, I encountered lots of young adults who served as my counselors. Most of them were college students. And these young adults, these college students, expressed and showed and spoke the love of God to me. All I can recall is that in that moment, in those two weeks, as a kid who had never really set foot in a church, that I had felt and experienced being loved by God and others in a way that surpassed even the love of my home life. And these young adults kept talking about this guy named Jesus, who I had never heard of before. And I remember, I'm told this story, I actually don't remember it in my own mind, but my mom tells me this story, that when camp ended, I rode my bicycle back up through the neighborhood to the church and began circling around in the parking lot. And one of the people who worked at the church came out into the parking lot, and I was crying. I didn't want camp to be over. Something had happened to me. I had encountered something there that was new and fresh to, to me. In retrospect, as an adult, as I gaze upon that experience in my life, the encounter within those two weeks introduced me for the first time to this person, this risen Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And I experienced the love of God and the body of Jesus in the church through everyday ordinary people. For me, as I reflect back upon that experience with the risen Christ, now with adult eyes and language, it could all be wrapped up in the word and the experience of love. Those two weeks have changed my life forever. I don't have time to tell you the details of that and even the details of my own family being changed and impacted by that experience. But it, it, it changed my life, its path, its trajectory, its aim, its purpose, and even in this moment as I stand before you today, it is foundational, a beginning reality of who I am. If I like Peter in the story we read, were to answer Jesus' question, who do you say I am, BJ? I'd say, you are love. God's love through the church, through human beings, 
was my initial encounter, and it has been a constant and consistent awareness and encounter of who I know Jesus to be ever since then. It has shaped my sense of call in discovering my own self and my deeply belovedness in the presence of God, and since then I have sought to create space for other people in my life to discover that they too are loved by God. What about you? What's your story? See, the fundamental reality of our faith journeys as Christians, people who follow after Jesus, the Christ, begin and at key moments throughout our faith journeys circle back time and time again, in my opinion, to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? And we could put lots of different tones and attenuations on that, right? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Can you recall a moment in your own faith journey? Perhaps it's in the beginning, like mine. Perhaps it's somewhere in the middle. Perhaps it's in a particular season of your life. Perhaps it's right now where you are prompted to ponder and even wrestle with the question, who do you say Jesus is? When you think about it, what draws you to Jesus? What attracts you to Jesus? I invite you just for 15 or 20 seconds, if you're willing to just close your eyes. However you picture Jesus, that historic person who is also the Christ. See his face, whether it's light or brown or darker, whether his hair is long or short. Look into his eyes. And hear him ask you that question. Who do you say that I am? What is your response? Don't overthink it. Just notice what naturally emerges for you as you answer that question this morning. At the heart of this, no matter what your answer is this morning, at the heart of this encounter emerges for each of us is a fundamental reality of who we are. Our responses will depend upon our story, our upbringing, our social location, and where we stand as we gaze upon the multifaceted diamond of the person of Jesus Christ. Let me put it this way. I'm trying out this theory this morning, which is always dangerous in a sermon. How we answer Jesus' question, who do you say I am, helps us answer the question about who I am. I have this theory that perhaps Peter's declaration in that moment is a typology. It's a type for all of us as human beings. We, like Peter, when we answer that question of that personal and intimate encounter with Jesus the Christ, we begin to discover something about ourselves. The image and likeness of God, the fundamental imprint of God, the beauty of God is mirrored back to us and us back to God. It can be a moment of standing face to face with God, if you will. And as God gazes upon us and we return that gaze to God, a reflection and a mirroring happens and we discover something more about ourselves. God is reflecting to us who we are and we are reflecting to God who we believe God to be. And the image and likeness of God that has always been in us presents itself to us and becomes clearer and is revealed in more detail by God's grace. Like the psalmist says, in your light, O God, we see light. Or in the words of the great Quaker mystic, which is at the top of your bulletin this morning, if you want to read along and ponder these beautiful words, 
Thomas Kelly says, deep within us all, there is an amazing inner sanctuary of the soul, a holy place, a divine center, a speaking voice to which we may continually return. Eternity is at our hearts, pressing upon our time-torn lives, warming us with intimations of an astounding destiny, calling us home unto itself. Yielding to the light within is the beginning of true life. It is a dynamic center, a creative life that presses to birth within us. It is a light within us that illumines the face of God and casts new shadows and new glories upon the human face. End quote. A coming home to ourselves. A light within us that illumines the face of God and casts new shadows and new glories upon our own human faces. In this graced mirroring, we discover a deeper sense of ourself, our calling, and our unique way of being in this world and in the church. Returning to the story of Peter, Jesus, if you will, gives us a new name and says to us, just like Peter, blessed are you. Blessed are you, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by God in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Peter is not the rock, but Peter means rock. And it must have captured some essence and divine reflection of who Peter was and that part of who he was is essential for Christ to build Christ's church. Are you with me? Just like you. Upon you and me and us and each of our fundamental personal encounters with the Christ will Christ build Christ's church. In the inner sanctuary of our souls, we see and experience Jesus the Christ, and we mirror that deep human felt and real need in each of us, and in turn we discover who we are in the larger part of the body of Christ. That's what I know to be true in my own story. The need and the longing that somehow was present in a 10-year-old kid that I experienced that love as a 10-year-old boy became a hallmark of how I wanted to live and manifest myself in this world and my specific part of the body of Christ. This deep desire I had as a child to be seen and valued and appreciated for who I am in my essence was met and fulfilled in Jesus the Christ. I saw in Jesus and through the church the reality that I am God's beloved child. And that was and is my story, and it has become the way in which I participate in the church, the body of Christ, in the here and now as an adult. You see, these very personal encounters with Jesus are the building blocks of the church. When we are in touch with that fundamental reality of who we are and what our story is, we can be more effective and healthy part of being used by Christ to build Christ's church. Amen? Okay. Good job. Now speaking of the church, you don't need to be a sociologist these days to know that the church in North America is in a new and difficult place. Just this week, the Pew Research Center said that the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not the N-U-N-S, the nuns, those who check none for their spiritual or religious affiliation, just became the highest group of spiritual and religious people in the United States of America. That's my four children. <laughs> We sit in a different landscape these days in the post-pandemic reality of what it means to be church. 
In 2020 through 2022, the Reverend Dr. Eileen Campbell Reed did a qualitative research to see how the COVID-19 pandemic and social uprisings were impacting the life of the church. She surveyed 108 clergy and lay leaders from 20 different denominations, 20 different states, ages from 20 to 80, and roughly an equal number of men and women. And I just recently read this 31-page qualitative research study. And I want to highlight just two things for you to think about what does it mean for you to be one of the building blocks of church in this time. First, she says, the church is continually experiencing being pulled up short. Let me read what she says about that. And I quote, Living in a new era of ministry means more experiences of being pulled up short. That is, coming face to face with our not knowing. Yet it is the only way forward to learn the complexity of how to lead through unprecedented times. Everyday routines and business as usual will not give us what we need for this new season. End quote. Can you think of a time in the last three to four years, either in the church or out in the world, where you have been pulled up short, where you have come face to face with the fact that you don't know what to do and the church doesn't know what to do? We don't know the answer. We don't know how to respond to particular situations. What was that like? What is that like to sit in a place of not knowing? This feeling and this experience as the landscape around us continues to change is the new normal. We will need to become comfortable with not knowing. Just look around us in this amazing and beautiful sanctuary. Does this place strike you as a place of not knowing? There's no judgment here because this is happening to every church, whether a tiny country church in rural America, an urban large church like this, or a brand new church in some storefronts on our city. We will need to be creative, innovative, and adaptive people in the church to think imaginatively and outside the box to begin to experiment, experiment with how to proceed into the next chapter of our life in this new era of being church. And we will need to know who we are and who Jesus is. We will need to be self-differentiated and non-anxious people, working together to wonder and be curious and discern how to live faithfully with the questions that we might not even have the answers to. The good news is this. I believe that this is possible for East Liberty Presbyterian Church. And the hard news is this is going to stretch us and challenge us. Second point she makes. She makes lots of points. I'm just choosing two. Grief and loss. Grief and loss. Quoting again from the study. The multiple chronic pandemics of racism healthcare disparities and economic inequities that were revealed in the last two plus years evoked a loss and a need for lament. One pastor in the study said, we do not know how to process this grief and it has become so prevalent and apparent. And it is not acute grief, but it is long-standing grief that will likely carry with us into the next five years. There is no return to normal, no having things the way they used to be. The losses are real and enduring. They need to be named and grieved, acknowledged and ritualized and plumbed for their meanings. We cannot move fully into the new era of ministry without concurrently attending to our grief over what we lost and for all that is passing away. End quote 
cannot move fully into a new era of ministry without concurrently attending to our grief over what we lost and for all that is passing away. What are you aware of in this church or in your experience of being in church that is passing away, the shifting ground underneath our feet, the things that are moving away, we can't return back to the way it used to be. If we could only just, if we could just, however you would finish that phrase. How might we at ELPC need to attend to the grief and lament of those losses of the shifting reality of church? How can we as your elders and session and staff create space for that kind of laments and grief, grief and loss? I ask you and invite you to email us, speak to us about that reality as you experience, as that idea of grief and loss lands with you this morning. One closing thought. What if all of this changing reality in our world, in this post-pandemic reality, what if God is leveraging that to wean and grow God's church? Author Elaine Heath asked the question, is it possible that the church is in a dark night of the soul? The dark night of the soul is a phrase by St. John of the Cross which is experienced in an individual's life when God seems absent. Could it be that God is using all the external realities happening in our world, the unknowing and the grief and loss, that God is inviting the church to detach from anything that is not about God and God alone? In my opinion, for the most part, the pandemic realities simply shed light on what was already present in the life of the church. What if the re this reality of the church of not knowing what to do and this long-standing grief is being used by God to loosen our attachments to anything but God and God alone? The external trappings of a building Membership numbers, an endowment, prestige in the society, in neighborhood and presbytery. If so, if God is using those realities to help us to let go and be focused on God and God alone, let us lament and grieve those losses of those external things, of the way things used to be, and surrender into the new era that God might be inviting us into. What if these larger social reckonings are seeking to dislodge in the church are often hidden, white, male, heteronormative ways of being church? And don't miss the irony of who's saying that statement. If so, let us, let me, let go. Grieve the pain the pain that we have caused others in our complicity in participating in systems of white male heteronormativity and surrender to God. This is just a theory that I pose to you this morning. But if this is true and we choose to say, God, we don't know what to do, we are grieving and we're letting go of control, we come to the end of these attachments and accomplishments and activities and accolades and we will be left with one question. A question that leads us back to our essence, the fundamental reality that takes us back to the beginning of who we are as individual people and as a church. We will be standing once again face to face with Jesus, hearing him ask us once again, who? Do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Friends, I don't want us to be discouraged 
in this space. The good news of the story, the good news and the reality of this is that in the renaming of Peter as the rock, Jesus says to Peter, upon you and you and you and you, I will build my church. The building of the church is actually not our job. The building of the church, as we sang in our opening hymn, is the work of Christ. So much so that the gates of Hades, whatever you think of hell these days, the gates of Hades will not prevail. So as we travel this next chapter of unknowing as a church and as we grieve and lament the losses, let us strive to be good soul friends to one another, creating space to hold hard things. Let us be curious and encouraging to one another when we feel really lost and discouraged and when grief feels overwhelming. Let us help one another to let go and surrender, calling out things that are old and need to be surrendered. Let us be non-anxious and listen deeply to one another as we live into this new era of being church here at ELPC and in the broader life of the church of Jesus Christ. Let us remind one another of the promises of Jesus that it is he, Jesus the Christ, who is building his church and he knows what to do. So much so that even the gates of Hades will not prevail. May it be so in us and among us this day. Let us take time to ponder, to dwell quietly before we turn to prayer where God is stirring in your heart this morning.